welcome back to the Ink Sync. I am Annie. I'm Kaylee. This is the publishing podcast for the rest of us, where we cover books and news and writing and reading, and we are so excited to bring you today our favorite news. That's right. Uh, I love a good myth bust. Christmas is a huge time for books. Those of us on the bookish, cozy corners of the internet, Mm -hmm. uh, you might have heard about the Icelandic tradition of the, quote, book flood. Had you heard of this? I had not heard of this, but it's so charming. It's one of those ones that, like, I feel like every Christmas there will be, like, a a viral tweet that goes around be like, this is the cutest thing I've ever seen. And it'll be like, Iceland people give each other books. Uh, Icelandic people give each other books and curl up and read them all day on Christmas and Christmas Eve. It's like a super cozy image. The Smithsonian Magazine dug deep on it and said, uh, actually, there's a little bit of nuance here. Like many holiday traditions, it does vary from family to family. The Icelandic book industry does get a huge boost around Christmas, though, which again, very good and charming. And Iceland does have a huge literary culture, but the internet kind of cozy meme, it's more of a, some families do it, some families don't, some people don't really care. <laughs> As with anything. Yeah, Sorry. right, exactly. I did, it was interesting, they said that time of the year, um, like they do like a lot of their sales, like in that four month window leading up to yeah. the holidays. And yeah. that can really make or break an author. So Mm -hmm. it was very interesting. I I, I really appreciated like the history, apparently, you know, starting after World War II with the import export taxes that were levied. Paper was not one of them. So they were able to that's, you know, they just wanted to have a nationalist like thing that they were trying to rally and get like jobs and keep their people, you know, fed and entertained. So it's it's part of their cultural identity, this literacy, which Mm -hmm. is very cool, especially because... I don't know if this is like common knowledge, but people in Iceland, most of them do speak English, but the Icelandic language does also still exist. And a lot of these books are in that language. It's kind of like keeping it alive, which is probably one of the most charming Christmas traditions. Mm -hmm. It's very sweet. It is. I agree. So those, these were, the first three articles were a really good Good. choice, Annie. I'm I'm glad. I wanted to start us off with happies. Let's move on to book bans. Oh no, it's a sad story. Um, <laughs> actually, it's not a sad well, no, story. No, this, this is, is actually yeah. this is like fighting it. Yeah, yeah libraries been... are given money to buy books. Yeah, Good. Uh, we've been covering the saga of book bans um, in this U.S. school library system for a while. There's a movement out there to get books that mention non-straight, non-cis people or relationships out of school libraries. Uh, There's also a push to get books with political messages out of school libraries. We've covered some of the books that have been banned, but also we've also talked about how books genuinely just disappear when they get banned sometimes. And that's really sad. Um, This article specifically is from Publishers Weekly in an initiative called We Need Diverse Books. They created a fund to help school libraries buy books and educate their communities. They say this is the next step in the fight against censorship. I I'm very heartened. Yeah. Um, but also I'm still insanely upset about the yeah. ongoing politicization of our libraries. That was kind of my thing. Like I, I appreciate, I'm sure libraries appreciate funding, but I don't think funding was the problem. I think the problem was this, this weird like politicization of the library's inventory. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I do appreciate that. Like part of this initiative was, you know, making content to educate the communities. I think that would be super helpful. Yeah. For them to say, hey, like, here's what's actually in this book, and here's why I think it's important, that kind of thing. I think that that will be super helpful. Show people what goes on behind the scenes. Yeah, I think you're right. I do. Um, I'm also, I can't remember, was it one of the articles in here, or was it just something in my news feed? I was just, I was reviewing about, like, the overall state of, like, book banning in the country, and, like, how to sidestep some of the actual, like, illegalities of just trying to, to ban books and like to to cite laws that don't actually exist or that are flagrantly unconstitutional certain conservative members of certain communities are moving to pass very vague and non-specific like local legislation or statutes mm. or policies that make it easier for them to then pull books off of shelves and that there's a lot of community 
concern Mm -hmm. because of that. Yeah. Um, I'll have to find that article because I don't, from your look, I'm going to say it wasn't one of yours. No, it wasn't one of mine. So I was just browsing through based on my, is one of mine. I'll I'll, I'll find it. Okay. um, And we can throw that that blurb in as well. Cool. Yes, please do. Uh, And we'll add links to these initiatives in the show notes if you want to give to the uh, We Need Diverse Books Fund. Moving on to something slightly better. Uh, Social book clubs. Yeah. Still a thing. Yeah. I've never been a part of a book club. I don't know about you. No. Um, I am any, like, you've given me a book. And I'm still, I currently have it. Yeah. Right here. That was like a year me. ago. <laughs> currently. <laughs> that was one of our first episodes. I said, Kaylee, you need to read this book. Well, so yeah, but you didn't give it to ago. me until. <laughs> so I'm, the, the, the thing is, Annie Kaylee is says, not, well, technically. <laughs> Annie is not wrong in that I had access to the book at that time. Um, I am just, sometimes my little brain goblin is not going to let me read a specific thing. So unfortunately, but, um, that's my issue is that I, I I can't, unless it's a homework, like I have a grade resting on, I've paid money for somebody to grade me on. I can't force myself to do it. That's totally reasonable. I don't like being told what to read in general. So I've never been on a, into a book club. I always thought it'd be a cool idea though, to have like book club, like in quotes where you just like show up and talk about your favorite book and not, like no, we don't all have to read like, it together like books anonymous yeah <laughs> yeah readers anonymous <laughs> hi my name is annie i read this today it was really great thank you bye <laughs> this was my favorite character all right peace <laughs> let me tell you about pax and Ari. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. paxi's the best paxi's the best anyway but so this <laughs> This article is from The Guardian. Virtual book clubs headed up by celebrities like Reese, Re- Re- mm. like Reese Witherspoon and Oprah are on the rise. I'm sorry, I did You did couldn't, it. Couldn't. <laughs> I got all the way through Penguin Random House and Simon and & Schuster and I was so proud of myself. But that's that just I that your brain, I said your brain relaxed. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Stop dodging and bobbing That's and weaving. Right. Uh, more and more people are jumping into these social virtual book clubs to read the books and have discussions with fellow book readers. I thought this was interesting. Reading is actually, you know, it's kind of a solitary activity, but a lot of people are very social and this gives them, you know, that through line. Uh, they talk about the books and connect socially. At the same time, the celebrity brands are pegging themselves to the books, which I think is pretty new. I actually don't remember that happening before I, I know Oprah's had this book club for a long time, but I feel like this celebrity book club boom is new. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that it was a slow process. I think Oprah's was one of the most publicized. And yeah. I think we started seeing it. I, I vaguely recall it being a thing for um, the actress. Um, what's her name? Well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> doesn't matter. So uh, there were one or two like yeah. throughout time but like during covid especially like especially for these virtual book clubs like yeah. that was it you know like this was like a way for people to really yeah. connect these are like the like the hardcore book clubs too like they everybody reads the same book for a month and then they all get together and talk about it what they liked what they didn't like that kind of thing mm-hmm. just fast it was it was really nice i like i thought this was really sweet it was kind of charming really heartening to see like there's like a million perma crises in the world but in the middle of all that people are like I want to read a book with Reese Witherspoon. Like, it's kind of cute. I yeah. like that. And like, it's, and it's like the person who's here is like, it's it's not like super high pressure or anything. Yeah. Like, you know, you, you could be part of the organization yeah. or whatever. And then this Guardian article was really sweet. The author was talking about her rush to finish the book of lest Reese be disappointed in her. Mm, it was very cute. <laughs> it was. And yeah. then like, like the 150 like person discussion, which isn't unmanageable. Honestly, like they had the author and they had, um, so I guess Reese wasn't as part of that particular. Rude. I know. It was very rude. Um, you know, I guess she has a life or whatever. It's fine. Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I mean, that's, that's cool. It's like an idea. The idea there for people that are interested is socialization is hard. If you've ever tried. <laughs> okay. All in right. Case, you're with me. I know yeah. you're, Annie, I know you get it. <laughs> I do. Um, if you've ever tried to like make a phone call when you didn't have a script in front of you for like work, like, you know, that just trying to figure out what to talk about with other people Mm -hmm. where, I mean, it's, it's awkward and it's concerning because what if you expose something about yourself that they think is weird and how do you respond to that? This gives you a specific topic so people Mm -hmm. can get their daily dose or their weekly or monthly dose of contact (laughs) in a safe and controlled fashion. (laughs) I love this. It's perfect. No, it's a, it's like a, it's like a conspiracy of friendship. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, people want people want friendship, but they also like don't want to, to 
like it, there's a lot of dangers in the world yeah exactly yeah so you have to talk about a book an external thing a book I, I d- technically technically you could say that um I met two of my bridesmaids in a movie club that's true yeah yeah so like it works it does it just you find you don't a even topic. need Reese Witherspoon to shame you that's for true. not finishing a book that's true. <laughs> So, like, having a single topic and then growing from there yeah. is totally, totally, like, a long-term respectable yeah. way to meet people and have, have that be, like, your main thing that you I start with. I story. I, we're going to post it in the show notes so you guys can see this adorable story of this person mm-hmm. <laughs> scrambling to finish her She's like, no! I don't <laughs> want anybody really to be mad at me. Yeah. Moving on, if you are a big ebook reader, you have probably noticed a suspicious thing out in the world. Most ebooks are exactly the same price across all platforms. But Annie, it's not fixed. No matter what store you're looking at, it's a mystery on how they get that way. Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Google, Apple Books, how does it happen? They're all $4.99 or $9.99. Nobody knows. What's it somehow? Mystery? Why? What's happening? Well, we've talked about it before on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain. Uh, a lawsuit last year claimed that Amazon and the publishers were fixing these prices, um, but a judge shot that down because the judge said there's no proof. There's no <laughs> proof that it was it done was on purpose somehow. Yeah. This one comes from Publishers Weekly. Uh, so this lawsuit is back. The judge dismissed it uh, back in September, but now they are trying one more time. The lawyers are accusing Amazon and the big publishers in the U.S. of price fixing once more. And once more, Amazon and the publishers have said they are not price fixing. They're just setting them at a certain amount. Yeah, they're just setting the price. It's not price setting. It's just setting the price, Kaylee. Get it together. <laughs> what am I What am I doing with my life, Annie? Um, so the last lawsuit, again, we said it, it was dismissed because there was no proof. I doubt they've suddenly come up with any proof since september but who knows um it's not super likely that this is going to go through again but uh if the lawyers win we get cheaper ebooks so yeah go lawyers i mean i would say like I, obviously conspiracy theory time Let, like oh, i'm, I'm, I'm me, curious if they're just trying to work out like the defenses against their arguments while they're actively seeking the proof because they can continue mm, to bring deposition. this deposition sure yeah. yeah they can continue to bring this lawsuit i learned, I learned the word deposition um, <laughs> from watching that pepsi wears my jet documentary no. Did you hear about this? No. Okay. Well, we might cut this out, but <laughs> there's we a have we, we have we have be real for a reason. We do. There's a documentary on Netflix back in some. I guess it was the 80s or the 90s. Pepsi, as a joke, they said, put out an ad that said, "If you get enough Pepsi points, you get a jet, like seven million points or something." And they're like, "No one could possibly oh, get seven no. million points." And then this kid got seven million points, and he's like, "Where's my jet?" And he. T- Pepsi took him to court being like, we don't, we're not going to give you a jet. And he countersued. He's like, give me my jet. And so the, the documentary is called Pepsi Where's My Jet. And they, they found the kid again. And like all of his, like, he had, he had a, a business partner who was just like his mentor who just happened to have a lot of money laying around to help him get all the points. And then his friend's family lawyer. Yeah. And then this one like random media lawyer that they found who was able to like get them on TV and they grabbed everybody back together and they're like, oh yeah, that was really fun. Do you guys remember that one time we sued Pepsi? I love it. That's fantastic. I gotta look that up. You should. Um, but they, they went through like basically how, if, if it had been a perfect case, how they would have had to go about doing it to actually get Pepsi to give this kid a jet. So deposition, they would have had to depose the people who made the ad who would have said, like, yes, it was supposed to be a joke, but we made it less of a joke so that it wasn't funny. So I think it was a real offer. Like, everybody was like, I think it was a real offer. Pepsi should have given that kid his jet. <laughs> Even now, like, 20 years later. That kid, that kid, kid deserved, deserved his jet. jet. He did his best. Anyway, so I learned the word deposition from Perfect. the Netflix documentary. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I don't remember what we're talking about. It's um, yeah, so this, so you're right. Yeah, like they can keep asking for more information to try and find the proof that they need that there is price fixing going on. We said, I don't remember, we've used like a, it's these guys meeting in a shady parking garage in their trench coats. And we think, oh, yeah, we just, we just don't deep, have the proof. Deep throat. Yet. Yeah, it's we just don't have the proof. 100%. Yet. The smoking yeah. man in the background. Yeah. Um, obviously, biased if uh ebooks prices were lower i would not be mad but i will always take an opportunity to remind everyone your library has ebooks even my grandmother's local library in the boonies in missouri has an app 
So yours probably does too. You can get free ebooks from your library. And also, the more you use them, the more your tax dollars are seen going to fucking buying the same book every single time. And maybe we can fix that problem. The library will get more books. Yes. So the argument, um, obviously, from the publishers and Amazon is that they never talked to each other. They just based the prices on market forces. So capitalists on this other side are saying, you know, the system is working as intended. But there is a problem, I will say, you know, kind of on the horizon as if Amazon keeps consolidating power in ebooks, we may see price increases across the board, which is really the the concerning future there that I think is what these lawyers are kind of arguing is what we don't want. So they're going to keep trying to find. Well, that's what I'm saying. I think they're going to keep bringing the argument while they seek out the proof yeah. just to one, keep it in the public eye, but two, also like, hopefully they're going to try to get more information or trip these people up or again. So as they approach it from different angles, see how the publishers are responding. Yeah. And then they know how to build their counter arguments later. Right. When they actually go forward. Yeah. So like I, Godspeed. <laughs> You're doing the Lord's work. Good in the for meantime, you. do it. Do use it. Use your local library. And in the meantime, always go to the library because it's wonderful. Moving on. Speaking of libraries, pirate libraries. <laughs> if you've sailed speaking the seven of, seas, speaking of the cohort. Yeah, right. Exactly. If you've uh, if you've ever tried to pirate an ebook, which is not something that we recommend, but we acknowledge that it happens. Uh, you might have heard of a service called Z Library. It is a free database of ebooks. Had you heard of this? No. Okay. Well, the FBI shut it down, so it's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> the London Review of Books took the opportunity um, uh, with this story to do a deep dive on shadow libraries like uh, Z Library. And they actually had some surprising findings. I was really interested in the stats that they were able to dig up. Uh, some of the books and documents in, this, in the databases available on Z Library were not available literally anywhere else, in print or online. And shutting down sites like this, it turns out, does not significantly increase legit library or authorized database use. They pointed out that shutting down these libraries may actually exacerbate inequality. Separately, and this article is from Vulture, some people on TikTok, there's a rumor saying that it was the romance novel fans of Coho, the cohort, Colleen Hoover, um, who led the FBI to the databases. They were accusing people of pirating the most recent book, which we talked about had like the biggest uh, pre-release again. sales in history. And they're like, oh, but there's pirating. And it's like, I think it might yeah. not be pirating <laughs> if you had the biggest... A million copies sold. I mean, technically, yes, but also, are you being injured right now? Yeah, no, that's, but you're that's definitely a rounding you're error. punching down. You're, fine. Yeah. you're punching down now. But like setting all of that to the side. Yeah, right. Exactly. Like they could absolutely like what a surprise that this is going to impact like people that can't access these things elsewhere. Like you yeah. could absolutely look at it seems like our theme today. Music and like m- like uh, visual media content. Like if you make something accessible easily accessible via other channels, legal channels, will go to those channels. Right. It takes work to find these less reputable means to find this content. Yeah. And also make sure that it is like because like Z Library, these like anywhere pirate bay, pirate hubs. Right. They're not like really super curated. Mm. So not only do you have to find a legit source in this ocean of websites you also have to make sure that the actual content that you're trying to download is genuine and not a fucking virus Mm -hmm. like it takes time and you're not sure about it and if you don't have like the tools available to you 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 don't do it yeah um or you take time to learn and it's just effort and stuff that you're you're putting in so if you can go somewhere more legitimately and do it very easily and just give them like a reasonable amount of money yeah. or borrow it for a period of time, you're going to do that. Like yeah. generally the public will do that. Like that has been proven with streaming across the board. Um, when it is easy to access legally, people access it legally. When it's not available, like consistently, that's when people turn and actually do all of the work that I just described to pirate something. Mm-hmm. If you can't find it elsewhere or if it's just impossible for you to get to it. Yeah. Like that's when people like as a mass effort will yeah. go through and pirate something. Yeah. Like it's not fucking rocket science 
fam. Like, it's not that difficult. Like, what a what a mystery that this didn't impact sales. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. That was kind of the main point of the story. Um, I was paying attention also to the the stats that were kind of backing up the LBRs uh, jump into it. I thought it was really interesting. I mean, obviously, like, you know, shutting down things like this, it's not going to automatically make the world a worse place or anything like that. But policies like this do seem to contribute to unequal access to information. It seems like, again, like that's our theme for the day. We didn't even notice. Um, If you don't have the money to buy a document or find it another way, if it's even findable, it's also, you know, obviously, you know, shutting down one of these, they're going to crop back up. These databases have not been, you know, eradicated totally. It's There's probably going to be a couple more that pop back up again. Um, These libraries are obviously violating the law, but given some of the research should that law be adjusted is what the LBR was asking. And I think that's worth considering. I mean, it, it backed up the argument with a lot of these stats. Like you're saying that, you know, a lot of people do want to do you can turn, things. You can but- genuinely find those statistics and that proof in right. the like the last 30 years of the rise of digital technology, the rise of piracy. Like who does it – when is it actually impacting people and when does it get cut back? Right. And you can sh- – you can, there are very clear lines that can be drawn. I I could go find the studies again because I yeah. looked this up previously. Yeah, well, it's, uh, a lot of them are yeah. featured in this article and they're talking about how like a lot of the stuff is just not available anywhere else. You can't get it legally. You so, can't pay for it. There's yeah. no one to give their money to. Like you could reach out to the author, yeah. but they could be sued if they give it to you. Right, exactly. So, you know, it's one of those things that the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which is what a lot of these copyright laws are under, um, it's there have been calls for that to be kind of revised coming into, you know, the 2020s as we evolve our understanding of ownership and content these days. Speaking of AI. Yeah, exactly. We're going to get there in a minute. Swing into that one. <laughs> but hopefully that's something that they can consider. But, you know, again, obviously, because they are violating this copyright law, they are going to be taken down. And there's uh, there's no way to get around that one. Hey, cohort, don't lead them to the next science yeah, database. Come on, nice. guys. <laughs> like, Kathleen is going to be fine. Colleen. Colleen. I'm the worst. Definitely cut that out. They're going to come for me. <laughs> on your Facebook also. On my, yeah, on my TikTok account. You, yeah. you just cut all that out. We're going we're gonna to run now. Run to, run to the next story. <laughs> uh, moving on. If you've been online in the past few months, you've probably seen a lot of the buzz about the AI advances that we've seen. Um, if you haven't, an, an AI writing bot debuted called ChatGPT. Some early samples of its writing. They weren't terrible. Elon um, Musk is not trolling your fan fiction. I just want to put this out there. Like, that was a thing that was going around. He Um, is not personally involved. He was briefly involved with a company that I think wrote one of the softwares for for a writing AI bot. But he is is a different one. He was like years ago stepped away. So I just want to put that out there. Like, if you are generally tangentially aware of this as a topic, that's probably why he doesn't give a shit about your fanfic. Continue. <laughs> Elon Musk cares about my fanfic. Uh, well, of course he does, Annie. <laughs> he likes he likes that uh that uh Giddy in the Ninth. That's right. My Giddy in the Ninth fanfic. Mm-hmm. It's it's spooked a lot of people for a lot of uh various reasons. And then there's been, you know, kind of some discourse of like you're saying about how it's stealing from other people's work, but also there's the discourse about how uh this might, you know, replace writers too. So is AI, you know, coming for their jobs? Probably not no. yet. Um, we actually have a couple sources on this one. One is a really good breakdown of how professional writers might be affected from Countercraft, which is a fantastic newsletter. Highly recommend you guys subscribe to that Substack. stack. Um, we'll have all these links in the show notes. Uh, another one from Forbes talking about, uh, back to copyright, who owns the content when you've created it using a chat bot. And um, this other one from MIT talking about the quality of the writing from an aesthetic perspective. Um, and basically, uh, the, the consensus really is that it's going to affect the freelance writers and academics probably more than anyone else. Um, a lot of spammy articles you've probably seen, they're already AI generated. Um, you can kind of tell when you get one of those across your dash. Uh, it's likely that more advancement like this is just going to mean more of those articles. Out and in it's the world. a lot of the clickbait. So guys, just in yeah. general, let's just, I don't think we've revisited this topic in a while. So just okay. going to put this out there. You don't have to click the articles like if something comes to you and you're like that's that's wrong and that's outrageous you can go to google (laughs) and search it search those terms separately and see if anyone else a legitimate source is talking about it in a less 
divisive fashion because it's almost certainly one generated specifically to outrage you that has no content um, or it links you to another one of their own articles that has the embedded media or whatever Mm -hmm. or two it was generated by an ai like it's generally just a content like creation machine so that they can get more clicks and traffic for their advertising revenue like yeah you, you don't have to feed that beast you don't have to click the clickbait you can control yourself it is baiting you but you are smarter <laughs> than a bear going under the box. <laughs> are you smarter than a bear going into a trap? I believe in you. Hopefully. We'll see. <laughs> so that's a weird metaphor, but yeah. but you yeah. you don't that is our industry right now and it is a problem. The only way we're going to solve that problem is if we step back and stop letting it work. Yeah. So those obviously are like the biggest probably way that AI articles are generated right now. The The concern, and this um, came from the Countercraft article, is that the more reputable articles, like the, you know, when um, a new Marvel superhero gets cast and like every site has to have like an article about that just to put the news out there. There are just like every single site is grabbing just a random freelancer and being like, can you write about this? Doesn't have to be long, kind of a low effort article just to make sure that we have that notification on our site. And basically that job might go away for a freelancer and the editor will just turn to an AI bot and say, write this and then edit it and then throw it up there, which is a lot less effort for them and a lot cheaper because it would be more or less the same content. Because everybody's basically reporting the same content. So that's one of those things where it is genuinely going to be changing the shape of freelancer work in the future, um, which we kind of talked about a little bit how like a lot of our professional writers get their start doing those like kind of low effort spammy articles, making those relationships with those editors and those websites to then hopefully write bigger and better articles in the future. So some opportunities will be definitely changing yeah. with the the industry will definitely be changing a little bit with this. And then another big question, we talked about copyright. Yeah, ownership. Like who owns these articles? Who owns the databases that are feeding these articles? Who owns any of it? Right now, um in the US, uh AI cannot own copyrights on anything so the it's, copyrights are owned by either the editor who edits edits it or the publisher who publishes it i think that we're gonna see legislation on this topic start and springing up more mm-hmm. on the from the art avenue from the art ai bots that are coming out and they're yeah. consuming and generating um i think that we're gonna start seeing the legislation that will apply to the writing bots mm-hmm. i think it's gonna be cross compatible or at least there's going to be we're going to start leveraging that because it's coming yeah. now yeah where we've got people using ai bots to generate content but of the art that these bots are consuming there's no no way to confirm that it's been fully ethically sourced like have you reached out Mm -hmm. to the people and gotten their permission to put it into this database that you're using to teach the bot yeah yeah exactly like so that all has to be considered um as a general rule like for the writing bot as part of the the article that we're discussing i thought the most interesting piece and probably assuming that we can confirm again that the content that is being consumed to start generating the style for the that bot Mm -hmm. um has been ethically sourced is open source. Like at that point, there's no owner. Mm-hmm. Like it is an open source piece, which means yeah. that you shouldn't be able to enter it into contests and mm-hmm. win prize money. Right. Unless, you know, there's some, it's going for your AI bot, I don't know, fund or whatever, sure. I yeah. guess. I don't know. Like I'd be interested to see that. But like, I think that was like the most moving argument as yeah. far as it goes. But again, you still have to, you still have to source your content. Like I don't necessarily want to say that there's anything wrong with AI produced art. Like you shouldn't say sure. art is anything in particular, writing or visual content media wise, like trying to limit what is art and how it is defined is that's a, that's a slippery slope. Yeah. And it's, it always kind of smacks of elitism to me. Anytime someone says, oh, that's not really art. Like I automatically am like, mm. <laughs> however ethically finding the content mm-hmm. that is that is an absolute hard line like you definitely don't get to steal somebody's stuff like that's you can't even just walk up like and like reproduce like somebody's shit you can't do that physically why would you be able to do that digitally that's you can still theft. but you're in violation it's theft. of copyright yes yeah. exactly so i think that's something to consider but like setting that aside i think that's the really the, the biggest argument that we have with AI today, and that's what's mm. going to have to be legislated carefully. Yeah. 
I'm kind of just glossing over the philosophical question of I don't think there is a philosophical question <laughs> of what is art. <laughs> yeah, like there's no that's the same question we've been asking for the last 3000 years. Yeah. It's true. How old are the cave paintings? I think they're older than they're older than three twenty thousand. Okay, we be more specific when you're five thousand because about- <laughs> God and the dinosaurs existed on Earth at the same time, and he punched a T Rex. Punched T Rex. I saw an article that was like, "This is the most interesting science test I've ever seen," and it was like, "Could God punch a T Rex? Did Jesus and the dinosaurs exist at the same time? Yes." And that was like, it was like, a, it was so stupid. And it was just ripped. They were like, when did it? When it was like, it was like the creationism, like God created dinosaurs and everything's within the last five thousand years. Right, right, right. It was very silly. Yeah, yeah. Moses was like, he rode on the back of a mastodon or whatever. Yeah, of course. Uh, Megalodon. The megalodon. Megalodon. That's it. (laughs) They ate sharks and were ten feet long. We were we were in the car listening to the most recent episode. Okay, go ahead. Um, And there's a part where I'm trying to remember the word Escher painting. And I'm just like, what is that thing with the stairs and it's going down forever? And I was like, I turned to Huey, I was like, why did I leave that in? <laughs> it's just me being like, what is a spiral? And you being like, a spiral? I'm like, no. Well, it's a drawing. <laughs> and I was like, I just put that out into the world. Like, why did I do that? It lets people know that we're real leave people. leave this one in, yeah. It lets people know that we're real. Leave it we're in. We're not AI bots. What is art? What is art, Kaylee? Let's think about it. Hmm. <laughs> let's just art. have a moment of silence yeah. while we consider. Let's all take a moment. Think about art. <laughs> I mean, some of the most moving poetry that I've I've told you about, because you mm-hmm. don't like poetry, but I've presented a you few have. very good poems to you. you and they're, not only are they community sourced and built up on different pieces, but they're generally like brought together by different methods and formats like it's basically the same idea as this ai bot like Mm -hmm. for generating art but again community sourced and Mm -hmm. it's physically brought together openly community sourced exactly and again it's open source and that nobody's making money off of it right and no one no one can own it and no one can own it so i think that like the what is art is the ongoing question and this doesn't the, the existence That's the of ai question, yeah. yeah exactly doesn't change that question yeah and in fact it shouldn't and anybody who tries to define it in an exclusionary fashion is a piece of shit instead of a celebrations and what we're reading section this time i wanted to remind everyone that we offer free advertising for any marginalized groups in publishing. If you have a work coming out or if you would like to plug your journal or your book or your article, we would be happy to advertise that for you. You can email us at inksinkpodcast at gmail.com with links to your work. And we also want to know what you are reading. We haven't gotten any messages in our inbox in a while, and we miss you all. You can email us also at inksinkpodcast at gmail.com. Let us know what you're reading. Let us know what we should be reading. If there are books that are just going under our radar, let us know. We are super interested. We really appreciate everybody listening, and you can follow us on all of our social media and listen to the podcast on any podcatcher, including YouTube, and see the text version of the podcast on Substack. And you can get all of those links at our link tree, and we hope to see you all next time. Also, thanks, Abby. Bye!